morning. The first lesson this morning comes to us from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our disease. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life like an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the reading. Please stand as you're able for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So I don't know if anyone else, I'm still feeling that song that we, wasn't that good? My God, the spirit was really there. And, and one of the things we're wanting to encourage coming out of the pandemic is everyone here really finding your voice in worship. Because there's sometimes a feeling like, oh, if we can, especially the Lutherans, we'll say part of this is a Lutheran problem, but like when you come, like if you feel raising your hands or moving or clapping or being like, yes, like do it. We want to hear that spirit and we want to feel that energy. And that's one of the goals as Amy and I have met and we prayed and talked about this service. Like we're on the way to this being such a full return. Um, but that, there's your part of it too, which is allowing yourself to just bring that. And I could, I don't know, I sit in the corner so I could feel it. I couldn't see what you were doing, but I could just, I was like, oh, there's something happening here today. So I just want to encourage you in that. I want to encourage you in expressing yourself in worship so that whatever God's doing in moving you you'll feel comfortable doing that. And if it's nothing, then do nothing. You know, like whatever it is that God's doing, do that. Um, I don't want to embarrass them. I'm going to embarrass them a little bit, but uh, Kirby and Robin, I'm so happy you're here. So Kirby and Robin, Robin's Nest, and they do so, you do so much for our community, you and your family. And well, you're part of it too, Kirby. You're part of it too. Um, but I just want to thank you for being leaders in our city. You know, you've really changed our city and it's for the better. And there are people I could name, none of them here, who are changing it for the worse, so you're, 
I'm glad that it's for the better. Um, so if you go out, you know, when you grab your coffee or donut or whatever, look at the wall in there because our sister preschool in Hiroshima sent us a bunch of pictures and it's all about peace and having our students become peacemakers. And so look at what they sent us from Japan and there's some translations on the wall and then our preschool is going to be sending them stuff from here. And this is part of the peace exchange that we're doing. We're doing it with our preschool and then we're gonna send high school kids to Japan next summer and they're gonna send kids here and then we're gonna send adults next year. So this is all about this exchange of peace between the two countries and between people who belong to God in different climates and contexts and languages, but who are all hearing the good news of Jesus. So check that out and be a part of that. Um, we have a really fun fellowship event coming up. So after church, check out uh, Cheryl and her table. I mean, really her table. You can check out Cheryl, but more her table than <laughs> what it is. But if you remember, we did the murder mystery night um, where we, it was like the cruise line. And now we're doing one that's like 1920s prohibition, like gangsters. So if you want to get on, you're like, hey, get over here, kid, get over here, get a knuckle sandwich or whatever. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, and I, th I think it's called Murder at the Juice Joint or Juke Joint or something like that. It's going to be a lot of fun. No one puts on a party or dinner like uh, Cheryl and the fellowship team. So we hope you can be a part of that. And as you leave today, grab something for Fall Festival. That's this Friday. So, you know, we have... Uh, trunk or treat, if you want to add your trunk to the trunk or treating. We have a chili cook-off if you want to add your chili. Uh, one of our new folks, Steve, is barbecuing for 120, so we're going to have a bunch of pulled pork and stuff. He does Tennessee-style barbecue. Um, it's going to be really fun. So come out. And then our Japanese ministry, they're going to have marble drink, and one of, our, one of their painters is going to have some of our paintings available. And uh, it's going to be a cool night. So Friday night, uh, hopefully you can join us for fall festival. Um, and then... I, I'm telling you all this because there's so much happening right now. Otherwise, you're just like, why is he? But I just feel I need to tell you all this. Uh, the week of Halloween, we're going to have a special kind of meditation on grieving, grief, after this year of pandemic, after this year of anxiety and loss. And it's going to start Halloween afternoon. We're going to do a concert. Our choir is going to do a concert that reflects on death, grieving, and hope in the resurrection uh, with choir music. And then um, that next weekend, there's a filmmaker in Huntington Beach that we've been working with for the last year to do a faith film festival. So we've had people submit original films from all over the world, and they're going to be screening them in a drive-in format in the parking lot. And we're going to be looking at human creativity in the face of grieving and death and hardship. And then that Sunday, which is All Saints Sunday, the first Sunday in November, we're going to do everyone together, two English services, the Japanese service, and we're going to do a big All Saints Day to remember all those who have died. And the Japanese do it in a very special way. And it's to remember the power of God in the face of death, you know, and the promise of resurrection. So over the next month, there's so much that you can do to get involved and be connected here and to have us grow together in faith, community, love, and fun. And you can wear a costume for at least one of those events. If you want to wear a costume for more than one, you can do that too. Uh, you'll remember last week, um, and if you weren't here last week, I'm going to tell you anyhow, um, that discipleship is very costly. To be a follower of Jesus costs a lot. And that's what we had with the rich young man, who he absolutely understood what Jesus was asking of him. And so we talked about it almost like preparing for a colonoscopy, that sometimes God just has to clean you out. Like, get everything out of the way so that we can see clearly your spiritual health and what you're doing. We might call them the spiritual polyps of our attachments, the things that are keeping us from truly following and answering that call. But when people hesitate, it's because they understand what God is asking of them. And one of the benefits that Jesus' disciples have, which we see very clearly from what Dana read this morning, is sometimes dumb people have it easier than people who know what's happening. And I don't want to just say dumb people, stupid people. I mean, they do have it easier in some ways. People who are willfully not listening. People who have taken the story and made it say whatever they want it to say. So think about that. The disciples watched this interaction with Jesus last week, as we did. And then today, James and John are kind of off in a little bit of a sidebar. And they don't go, man, maybe we got this wrong. Like, maybe we don't want to be doing this. He said it's going to be impossible and God has to do this work. And 
And then James and John go, well, now's our chance. Now's our chance to shoot our shot with Jesus and to ask him the question we've always wanted to ask him. And maybe you've had this if you go, if I could ask, sometimes people say this, when I get to heaven, I have one thing I want. I have a couple questions for God, which is, I think, a normal human desire. I have a few things I want cleared up about life. And imagine James and John get that chance. I get the chance to ask Jesus the one question I've always wanted to ask him. And you'll notice the question isn't, so how do we inherit eternal life again? Or like, so what does it mean that we follow you more closely? They shoot their shot and they say, actually what they do before they ask their question is, Jesus, give us what we're asking for. Which is the same thing when someone you love comes up and goes, um, promise you won't be mad. And then you know, like, oh, okay, well, what are you going to say? Well, I'm not going to tell you until you promise not to be mad. So they go, Jesus, give us what we're asking for. And he goes, okay, well, what are you asking for? And then they say, we want greatness. We want to be like you, one on your right, one on your left. And the other disciples are angry. And they're not angry, I think, because James and John asked that question. They're angry because they didn't get the chance to ask it first. Everyone has a little agenda following Jesus. See, this is the problem. They have their little agenda of what they want to do to leverage God for their own advancement. And that means their following of Jesus just becomes a kind of divine concierge service, like, hey, we've got God in our pocket to get us a little bit ahead. And then James and John go, forget it, let's just ask for the whole thing. The reason we're doing all this, the reason we left our father and the nets and the boat, it wasn't because we were necessarily interested in this stuff about the cross and Jerusalem and death and so on. We're more interested in securing our place. Like Dan and I have a friend who, when he first moved to L.A., was moving furniture for celebrities. I mean, he had this crazy job where they would build couches in downtown LA for $500 and then take them up to Beverly Hills and sell them for $25,000. And you know, moving rugs and going, no, move this here. So they go, never, ever interact with the celebrity clients in a business way. Don't ask them for things. And he goes, okay, so he goes and he's on one of his jobs and they're at Orlando Bloom's house, you know, from, uh, Lord of the Rings and Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff. I guess now we would say he's Katy Perry's husband. That's probably the only thing he's known for now. But uh, he, so this guy, they're moving furniture, and this guy goes, uh, Mr. Bloom, I wrote a script and I wrote it just for you and I want you to have it. And he gave him the script. And then he got immediately fired, but he didn't care because he goes, that's the only reason I did this because I wanted to shoot my shot. I wanted to get toward greatness and I wanted this to be part of my legend that if I ever make it, I can go, the reason I made it is I gave Orlando Bloom a script and I got fired, but it was worth it because that started me on my trajectory to greatness. And the disciples are saying the same thing. This is going to be part of their legend. Remember that time when James and John said, Jesus, give me this, and he goes, oh, I can't believe you asked for it, but yes, you can have it. And that's not what happens. And it's not what happens because they don't realize that the whole point of the story is going to be about losing, about giving, about serving, about going in an opposite direction of greatness. And God bless Dana for reading, can you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm going to be baptized? And then they go, yes, we can be baptized with the baptism with which you're going to be baptized, which is like, okay. is that the only way they could have said that, you know, by saying that word several different times in different ways? Uh, and that baptism is, of course, death. It is a kind of dying. Can you drink this death with me? And they go, yeah, I think we can do it. Yeah, I think we can do it. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to be great, why not? And he goes, you're going to do it, but not in the way you thought. One of the things that we have to get challenged by is for people like us who have said yes to Jesus, and I'm assuming the people who are here have said yes to Jesus. Yes, I want to follow. Yes, I want to be shaped by your love. Yes, I want to uh, move in the way that you make. We may not yet get what it is he's asking us to do. We may be like the disciples saying, you know, I have my own little agenda and angle I'm trying to work here. Because I'm just trying to carve out my little piece of significance in a world that is very difficult to make any space for anyone. And so I want to do my part, upward mobility. Jesus, you're my path to upward mobility. And then Jesus goes, well, what if I'm your path to downward mobility? And they go, what? And he goes, you all are acting like Gentiles right now, which for a room of Gentiles isn't really an insult to us because we're like, well, that's what we are. Um, but what he's saying is, what difference does your faith make if you're behaving like everybody else? 
That's what he's saying to them. He goes, you're the Gentiles' Lord authority. That's what you want. You want authority and power, and you want to be able to say, do it, and they'll do it because they're afraid of you. It's about power. Yeah, that's why one of the documentaries of fascism in the 20th century was called The Will to Power, or The Triumph of the Spirit, which was the will of power. It's a very German philosophical concept that might made right, and if you want it, you take it. And power is what dictates human relationships. And Jesus goes, no. That's not what dictates relationships. What dictates relationships is love and service, going downward, reaching down, offering a hand, creating space for vulnerability, not trying to use someone toward an end, not just turning people into objects that we do things on, but allowing them to be and live with the dignity that they were made to have. If you want greatness in the kingdom, says Jesus, go down, not up. Go down into the place of service. And it's funny, no one's angry about that. It doesn't say, and then the 12 were really angry because they're all going, well, he doesn't really mean it. And that's something that is challenging for us is sometimes we'll read these words of Jesus and we go, mm, I'm not sure he really means that because of course I have my own little plan that I'm trying to work out with Christ. Now there's another dimension to this which is we can talk about the self-centered problem of faith that we encounter and that we all participate in, kind of a spiritual narcissism. It's something, it's a problem, like it's a problem that we all have to wrestle with. Um, because of course we say, well, there's no one more interesting than myself, you know. Um, but we have to recognize the commitment of Jesus, and we, we sang this very clearly in the music, which was great, the commitment of Jesus to love us in spite of and even through our spiritual narcissism. And that love turns into pain for Christ. How is it that the prophet Isaiah, who is writing to a people in exile who are about to come home, and he's writing as a prophet of hope, comfort, comfort my people. I'm going to make a way for you in the wilderness. I'm going to create for you a way to return home and belong to your God, and you're going to be triumphant, and you're not going to be crying anymore. You're going to be laughing and praising. And then we get these weird punctuated marks of a distinct description of one person who will suffer for doing the will of God. There's four of these in Isaiah. They're called the four ser servant songs of Isaiah. They just sort of pop up in the middle of this prophecy of restoration, and then they kind of go down, and then they come up and go down, and you go, who is Isaiah talking about? And why is this way of restoration and doing God's will going to be spoken of in such terms as God's will was to crush him with pain? You know, I mean, you go, ah, that sounds bad. It almost sounds like a kind of sadism, like, oh, well, that's what we were worried about with God, that God does things like that to people. And what you have to understand about Isaiah is what Isaiah is saying, and of course, for the church, we see this clearly describing Jesus, is that God is going to keep loving you no matter what happens. And not only no matter what happens in external circumstances, but what happens in our own obstinate self-centeredness of trying to use God to accomplish our own ends. God's going to keep loving us. God's love doesn't pull back from us, and that will be experienced as pain and suffering for the heart of Jesus. When Jesus ends up on the cross, what he's suffering isn't just the physical experience of crucifixion. What he's suffering from is the rejection of love. This is God saying, I came to say yes, and this is our answer, which is murder, which is no. And Jesus doesn't go, oh, that's not how it works. You don't know who I am. I made you. And in the game of power, you don't have any, and you're out. Bring in the next group. He doesn't do that. He absorbs our no. He absorbs our self-centeredness. He absorbs our violence. And that becomes the experience of love as pain and suffering. Now, when you think about it, the experience of pain in our time is, for the most part, to be avoided. You know, if you think of our opiate problem and our narcotics problem, Oftentimes, we're trying to create distance from pain, which isn't bad. I mean, I, I take the pills, too. When, I'm in, you know, when the doctor goes, here, take this, you'll feel better. And I go, yes, thank you, thank you. So I'm not, saying we don't, I'm not saying we don't live in that world. But what I am saying is Jesus refuses any kind of narcotic so that he had, would have, let me say that again. Jesus refuses any kind of narcotic that would diminish his experience of loving you in the midst of, of whatever it is that you're doing or has been done or who you are or how self-centered you are or how broken you are or whatever. Jesus does not want to diminish one moment of feeling that love, which is translated into 
the immense suffering that we see, bearing our diseases, our infirmities, by his stripes we are healed, all of this stuff. And the interesting thing about it is this is where we see the power of the cross, which is in a world where power uses death to lead people to fear and manipulate their behavior, Jesus takes death to break death. Jesus uses death to destroy death, makes captivity captive. That's the whole point of the cross. How can Isaiah say that by his wounds we are healed? Usually we just say, by his wounds, he's just another poor guy that's body is broken down and now he needs a doctor or he needs a pain regimen. Oftentimes we just see the power of death, suffering, and illness as something to avoid because once we feel it comes to us and touches us, then we're stuck there. And here Jesus takes that and transmits it into healing. This is why we can talk about the gospel being good news because Jesus takes the poison wood of the cross and grows fruit that will be our life. You can taste it and it's good. You can taste it and it heals. And that means that in a world that does use the currency of violence and fear, that the church can even absorb that and have Jesus bring about life. Because if Jesus isn't going to do that, then you could reasonably ask, maybe James and John weren't wrong. But if Jesus does do that and has a different kind of economy that we're working in, this economy of healing, this economy of breaking that cycle of violence and vengeance and hurt, bringing about fullness of life, then in fact we see the way forward for disciples, this downward mobility to service, because we know where the true power is. It is the love of God repairing and healing and restoring the world. Now, one thing I was funny, I was praying, I don't know if you believe this or not, but I do pray about these sermons. Uh, but I was praying about the sermon early this morning. Sometimes I'll wake up and I'll be praying. Probably it's one of the, sometimes I feel like God has to wake me up because it's the only time I'm listening because I'm too occupied otherwise. Uh, he goes, he put his phone down, let's wake him up, wake him up. Um, but I had this very distinct image when I was praying about the sermon this morning about a car uh, like, I want you to think about your spiritual life and this, this call to discipleship and this calling to service like having a car. And that one of the problems that people are facing in our church and in our time, and it's, it's, not, it's everywhere, is they assume that the car will not go because it's defective. But the image I got when I was praying this morning wasn't that the car was defective, it's just that people aren't putting gas in it. And so sometimes we'll think that the project of discipleship is impossible because we're simply not putting gas in the car. You need to take time to put gas in the tank of what God gave you, primarily through prayer. You need to set aside time to pray, time to listen, time to sit in the presence of God so that God can fill you for this work. I actually had someone tell me that in Huntington Beach who's sort of prophetic. He goes, if you would spend as much time praying as you are working, you wouldn't be as tired in your work. And I go, well, I don't have time to pray because I'm working. And he goes, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Put your prayer first and then do that. Um, it's like one of, our, one of our members was at the Boys and Girls Club dinner last night and his wife told me coming out of church today, she goes, do you know what he bought at the auction last night? And I go, I go did you buy that motorcycle? He goes, yes. He bought the motorcycle, the dirt bike, this beautiful dirt bike that was in the Hyatt last night. And I go, oh man, that's really cool. She goes, no, you're not supposed to tell him that's cool. It's not cool. Why did he buy a motorcycle? <laughs> but she said, the first question we had is, uh, how are we going to get this home? And they go, well, you can't take it now because it doesn't have any gas in it. It doesn't have any oil. Brand new Yamaha, beautiful dirt bike. Uh, so they said, you're going to have to wait till it's ready. And I go, wow, that's like the image I had in my prayer this morning, which is, the engine is good, the car is sound, it's made to go for a long time, we just need these times to gas up. And so that's my word for you, which is Jesus tells us clearly what the path forward is, which is the path of service, the path of trusting and love and not wrestling for power. And along the way, he will refresh us so that in fact our work can be a contribution of healing in our community. That's why when we have all this preschool stuff on the wall, it's not just for art. It's to say that Jesus has given us a vocation as peacemakers. 
Part of sharing healing is making peace, God's shalom for the world. And so this is the way God will do it, by feeding us with his power, which is love. And by being loved, we can go about this work of redemption. Amen. <clears throat> Let's confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayer today, we've been asked to pray for Van and Wayne. You've heard us pray over the last month for Connie Wilson, one of our preschool teachers whose adult daughter was dying, and her adult daughter uh, died at the end of this week, Kim. So we want to pray for her and her high school age kids and husband and uh, this was a death that came as a mercy after a long period of illness uh, but we want to pray for them now in their grief so let us join our hearts together in prayer Jesus when James and John asked you that question did it break your heart your love that is open and seeking and thirsting for communion only to find your disciples standing there, only thinking about themselves. Jesus, forgive us for every time we have broken your heart with our selfishness, with our desire to use you for our own ends and not for your purposes. And so correct us and remold us, lead us downward into that place of service, trusting that we don't need anything more than what you've given us. We don't need anything more than who you are and who you've made us to be. So may we live with open hearts in the world. May we love freely. And when our hearts are wounded for loving freely, may you come and bring a blessing. Grant, O oh Lord, that the cost of following you might be something that we understand but even more so something we're willing to embrace even if we cannot understand all that it means as we live into the fullness of that baptism. We thank you, God, for every person here who is taking on that work of peacemaking, being a healer in our community. I want to thank you for Kirby and Robin and for their work of healing in our city, for the lives that are touched and for young people that are given hope for a future for all the people in this congregation who have supported that work. Bless us, O oh Lord, and bless that. May it be fruitful that hope might be the gift that people know instead of devastation and loneliness. We pray for the ministries of your church that we might continue to come and grow into this time. We might find ways to be connected to one another, a sense of belonging, a sense of joy, a sense of service a sense of fullness of life, that people can come and see that you are here and that by your spirit we are fed and that by that work we are a light, a light in our families, our marriages, our communities, a light in the greater darkness. Bless those, O oh Lord, who have authority over us, for those who govern, for those who have been elected, that they might do so with wisdom and justice. We pray for communities of people and places where people are separated by distrust and even an experience of violence, that you might come and bring restoration and reconciliation, that human communities might flourish and not feel threatened by one another. We pray for your creation, that we might use it wisely, not abuse it, destroy it, deplete it, eliminate it. May we be faithful stewards of your earth. We pray for Van and Wayne. We pray for Connie and Tom. We pray for Kimberly, who's come into your presence through death. For those who now grieve, for those who now 
live in that aching absence. May your Holy Spirit bring the consolation that only you can bring. And in the experience of our dying, may we see the promise of Easter and the promise of new life, the whole goal of your work and your suffering love. Bless us, O Lord, as we prepare to receive your sacrament for all that you give us. May we be filled with your grace and may it overflow into the world in which we live. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
As we just sing in that song, the cross shows us the heart of God. And for everyone that loves to argue about religion and theology and philosophy, that is our ultimate lens into who God is, the heart of God broken on the cross with love. And as we celebrate the sacrament, it is a reminder that each of us has some limit of love in our life, whether it's been a person that we couldn't love anymore or someone that betrayed our love. Or, I mean, that's part of being human is the limit of love. And yet when we come to this altar, God has no limit of loving. Whatever limit we experience, God doesn't have. And so God only pours love, only gives love, always gives love, even on the cross. And so as you experience this outpouring of love, I hope it washes over you and fills you for what God has in store for you. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After the supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup all of you and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to his supper. A reminder that for communion, we'll start with this side of the church. You'll come down the center, receive the bread and the cup, and then you can put your cup on the brown tray, and then we'll do this side second.
As we're standing here now in this moment, let's open our hearts in worship and join our hearts together in praise and see all the good things that God has in store for us as we finish communion and get ready to head out to this week of service and love. Let's really open our hearts in praise. Jesus, we love you, and we serve you in this place, and now fill us with your spirit that we can go about and sing loudly and raise our hands and clap and be glad for all that you've done and all that you are, and we ask you now to bless us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.